Dr. O'Brien, you are the senior lecturer in international law at the University of Western Australia, yes, yes. teaching inter alia international humanitarian law, and you specialize in the law related to the crime of genocide and the punishment of mass atrocities. In your opinion, is the exciting system of international legal norms adequate enough to address the issue of genocides? Yes and no. We have obviously the Genocide Convention, which this week we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of, and that gives us the definition of genocide that we use today. And that's been carried through into the statutes of international criminal courts and tribunals. So there is this, first of all, this definitive recognition that there is a crime of genocide that exists and that we should prosecute people for committing that particular crime. And obviously, so that's the first part that tells us, great, we have this wonderful system. But it doesn't mean that there aren't gaps in the system. So under the definition of genocide, we have only five enumerated acts that are listed there. And so this, for example, excludes specifically things like sexual violence. And sexual violence is a significant part of genocide. It, it is committed on a, on a mass scale that we see in genocide, through particularly rape and sexual slavery. And none of those kinds of crimes are actually included in the definition of genocide. So one of the things that we've seen the international criminal tribunals do is to have to adapt their own definition of genocide from what we already have. Because it's so limited, they've read into the current definition that there are things that actually exist. So the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda said that actually, yes, rape is genocide, mm -hmm. as it is under, the, under one of the enumerated acts, which is committing serious bodily or mental harm. And in fact, the ICTR said that rape is serious bodily and mental harm. So it covers both of those. So these are kinds of the, the ways that the international court system has adapted with the limitations that we have of the definition of genocide today. And you see, in terms of thinking about a whole system, I'm talking about the international criminal courts and tribunals, but of course we need to think of it as an entire system that works at the domestic level as well. So that's one of the things that the international criminal court does try to do. It works on not only its own jurisdiction, but it works with states to make sure that they do enact their own legislation, that they implement into their national law a provision that says we, you know, genocide is illegal. So this, is, this has actually created a really great system that we mm -hmm. have. And it's interesting because obviously most countries have adopted the definition of genocide as it is in the Genocide Convention and in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, but we have the occasional country that goes a little bit further. For example, Ethiopia, interestingly, includes political groups in its definition of genocide. So every now and then we see that there's a country that takes it a little bit further. And I think that over time, and I say over time, not in my lifetime, mm -hmm. but over several decades to come, we may eventually see an evolution in the definition of genocide that may be expanded in some ways, depending on state practice in that regard. So it is a yes and no as to whether it's comprehensive because we do have quite a good system but it just does have these little loopholes but I think that our system works quite well to try and we must improve it yes, yes yeah exactly okay on December 9 uh, 1948 the United Nations adopted the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide but already in 1946 the General Assembly adopted the resolution affirming mm -hmm. that genocide is a crime under the the international law and stating that yes. punishment for that crime is a matter of international concern. But what about denialism of genocide and don't you think that we need to criminalize that as well? Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, there are genocide scholars who, well, within the genocide scholar community, we talk about genocide as a process. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an event. And there are scholars who have said that actually as part of that process, denialism Mm -hmm. It is part of the process. So it's not even a separate thing to genocide. It is part of the process because it essentially means lack of recognition that genocide is committed, has been committed, but it also means that the victims and the survivors of the genocide 
uh, can't really heal properly because they're constantly being questioned as to what happened to them and what happened to their family. So I think it is really important and I know that there's a great argument about this and the, the other side of the argument is of course one of our most fundamental human rights which is freedom of speech. But of course we need to remember that freedom of speech is not unlimited. Yes. There are restrictions mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. freedom of speech and that includes things like hate speech. And the thing is that denialism fits within the idea of hate speech. So even if it's not the traditional sense of hate speech that we think about where someone says really awful things to another person because of their race or their gender or ethnicity or religion, it is in a sense denying that group's identity and their past. So it does fall within this broader sense of hate speech. And, but generally, it can fall within a limit, an allowable limitation to freedom of speech. So absolutely, uh, you know, denialism should be criminalised, I think. And, and I, I think it, it needs to be within a very specific limitation. So um, obviously there are genocides that it is very much debated about whether or not mm. they were one and which I don't think the Armenian Genocide is one of those, despite Turkey's opinion. Um, so obviously we can't have a blanket law that criminalises denial, denialism for any kind of genocide. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to be very specifically targeted. So for example, to those genocides that we very much know are genocides, like the Armenian Genocide, like the Holocaust, like Rwanda, like Srebrenica. So we can say that the denialism is like the continuation of genocide? Yeah? Yes, absolutely. It's part and parcel of it. Uh, I mean, in my own research, I argue that also refugee rights are part of the genocide process. So denialism as well, it's, it's kind of these things that keep going after the killing has stopped. They're still part of the process that the survivors are living every day. You know, they're refugees in a different country, they don't have a home, they've lost their family, if they're children, they're orphans. This is still part of their process. I mean, you have, I met a Holocaust survivor who only found out her real birth date in her 80s. She mm -hmm. was that old before she knew her real birth date. <laughs> so these things, they stay with the survivors. And denialism will stay with the survivors and the second and third generation and so on with their families. So it is a really important part of the process that stops reconciliation, that stops healing and, and you know, just stops people from moving on and being able to deal properly with what happened to them and their family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, after the Armenian Genocide, the enormous uh, cultural heritage was left behind, as you know. However, throughout the century, this heritage has been consistently destroyed in order to erase any traces of uh, Armenians living on the territories. Yeah. What says the international law in this case? Is there any possibility to protect this cultural heritage and not only to protect it from a physical destruction? <laughs> international law does protect cultural property. And I've, I've been to Western Armenia. I've seen the condition that the Armenian churches and monasteries and, and other buildings are in. Mm, ruins. Absolutely, <laughs> ruins. And, and they've been purposefully destroyed and, and some of them for example Varagarank church you can see that inside it's all black from where it was burnt at the time mm -hmm. um, other places have been actually pulled down specific things like crosses being removed mm -hmm. um, and, and elements of um, Islamic culture rebuilt into some of them as well so it's quite significant and I do know that UNESCO has been working in with Turkey and trying, being the operative word, trying to um, ensure there is a certain amount of, if not necessarily restoration, but at least maintenance of these kinds of properties. And I do think, though, that UNESCO needs to work a lot harder with that because they are the principal body when we're talking about cultural property and heritage protection. And we do have, in international law, we do have treaties and instruments that protect cultural property and particularly protect them in armed conflict as well. So these, the kinds of provisions that they have in there, they do need to be implemented 
because there needs to be protection for the property that was destroyed, even if it happened in the past. So mm. we're not just talking about you know, protecting cultural property from being destroyed now, we're talking about things that happened in the past as well. So I would, that's something I would like to see as UNESCO take, um, you know, much more to be a lot more proactive when it comes to working with the Turkish government to protect the Armenian churches and monasteries and other types of buildings that are remaining in Western Armenia, now Eastern Turkey. In which areas uh, have you seen some ruins not uh, related to Armenian genocide? Have you ever been some other places? <laughs> I have. I've done field work uh, all around the world. I've done field work in South Africa, in Germany, in Austria, the Netherlands, Cambodia, um, Armenia and mm -hmm. Western Armenia, or Turkey. Um, so I've been to quite a lot of places. And um, what's interesting is that I think you, you still see, obviously in terms of cultural destruction of property, you have, for example, like the Great Synagogue in Berlin, um, huge building, and in essence most of the buildings still exist, but they have preserved what was destroyed about that um, in, during the time of Kristallnacht and over the, the Nazi, mm -hmm. in the Nazi regime. Um, so, you, but you don't tend to see as much of these cultural property as you do in Western Armenia. And I, I think it's because a, so much was destroyed in Germany because of World War II. So a lot of things were simply just raised to the ground and rebuilt. Whereas Western Armenia is it's such actually quite a remote area. And some of the places that I've been to, there's nothing around. Mm -hmm. It's a monastery on a hill, an absolutely beautiful location, but there's absolutely nothing around. There's no villages, there's no people. So in that sense, the ruins of, of a monastery have been allowed to stay there because it didn't need to be knocked down. And that's actually probably quite fortunate that at least some of the ruins are still there. Um, in Cambodia, they, did, uh, they, they took out things like um, the, the Buddhist statues, mm -hmm. statues of Buddha that were in the temples that they had there and they were thrown into the river. So those kinds of things have either been lost or they were actually um, able to be retrieved from the river and put back into the temples later on. So the temples were repurposed for other uses there. So they most of the time were not actually destroyed. So luckily they were able to be uh, taken back as temples after the time of the Khmer Rouge, which was quite lucky. Yes. And the last question, Dr. O'Brien, how we can reconcile the principle of sovereignty of states and sovereign rights of the governments with the international concepts of responsibility to protect? The concept of sovereignty is a really long-held principle in international law. However, I think that things are changing. So mm. since the beginning of the 20th century, we have seen a complete overhaul of the international law system. So initially, international law was about states, it was about countries mm -hmm. and sovereignty. And that now has completely changed over the past 100 years or so, where we see there are other actors in international law, such as international organisations like the United Nations. We see individuals having a role in the international law system. For example, particularly in the human rights system, mm -hmm. where individuals are actually allowed to make complaints to human rights bodies at the UN. We see NGOs, non-governmental organisations, having a role in international law. You know, they have particular status at the UN and they're allowed to contribute. So this, is th this change in who has what we call personality mm -hmm. in international law is actually really important because it's a move away from this idea of sovereignty. And it's this aspect that has actually moved us towards the responsibility to protect principle because it's this idea that even though sovereignty exists, no government has the right to kill and completely destroy its own people. No government has the right to have mass human rights violations against its own people, to commit mass atrocities against its own people. So this change over the last century in the international personality of international law has had a significant effect in this regard. So this has been this creation of the idea of responsibility to protect or R2P for short where we say that if a country is committing these atrocities against its own people 
and doing nothing about it, that ultimately another country can actually step in and take action. Now, obviously, there are a lot of steps that have to mm -hmm. be taken before we're talking about military intervention because we like to, you know, hopefully take other means first, diplomatic means, negotiations within the General Assembly, within the Security Council of the United Nations. But ultimately, it's this change in the whole structure of international law that has led us to this principle of responsibility to protect, that in fact, actually, it is acceptable for another country to interfere in another country's uh, affairs within, within this particular narrow confines of mass atrocity protection. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back in your event.